Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Very Cold Lasagna Podcast, your place for all those filthy casual takes on the world of sports. I'm your host, Dylan Lasagna. This is episode number 186 of this icy yet spicy sports podcast. And in this episode, we're here to talk about a WWE pay-per-view that took place this past Saturday or, well, depending on where you were around the world. But nonetheless, we're here to talk about a pay-per-view that I was not willing to wake up at very early ass o'clock at 2 in the morning for. Um, but yeah, it was a pay-per-view that took place nonetheless. And that was WWE Elimination Chamber 2024 in Perth. So that was the reason why this happened at very early ass o'clock in the morning here in my time zone. But it may vary, uh, may have varied in whatever part of the world you were. But at very early ass o'clock, 2, a- 2 a.m., no, I'm not doing that. I'm not willing to sacrifice sleep, especially with the card that uh, we were given with. Um, a four to five match card. Yeah, it's, that that's not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> but it was in Perth, Western Australia. So that was the reason why um, this show was scattered all over the place in terms of what time you were going to be watching it. Um, even WWE promoted like, oh, here are the times that you're going to you have to watch. Uh, you're going to watch this show. And yeah. 2 a.m.? Hell no, brother. I even complained about that even before WWE started doing that. So, no. Wasn't going to do it. Um, So, I caught up on it, and I have a lot to say about it, per usual. So, anyway, I'm back, also back from my little break, my post-Super Bowl break. Um, A retro review of the 2004 edition of Elimination... Oh, sorry. It's not Elimination Chamber. It's No Way Out. Uh, The 2004 edition, the 20th anniversary of No Way Out. Um... It was a fun little pay-per-view to uh, go back and revisit. You know, I didn't watch it at the time, but um, really nice moment. It was a really, really, really fun pay-per-view to go back and look at. Um, revisit the 20th anniversary of Eddie Guerrero's big win, his big defining moment in his career. Fun stuff. Um, if you missed that uh, episode, I recommend you go back and watch that and then come back and uh, actually do that after this Elimination Chamber review. You know, unless I know, I don't know why they call it Elimination Chamber when I think in certain countries they call it No Escape. Just go back to being called No Way Out. Keep the you can keep the Elimination Chamber uh, match in the show, but it's just like call it, go back to calling it No Way Out. It's so stupid. But anyway, let's uh, go into a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with our Elimination Chamber review because uh, <laughs> oh boy, there's a lot to say about this show that yeah, I, I'm probably gonna. Uh, go on a ramble about but anyway uh, make sure if you're listening to this on audio uh, make sure you leave a review and give it one to five stars preferably five um, not trying to be a mark for myself but <laughs> give it however many stars you want to give it and leave me some feedback if you're listening to this on audio for all my audio only listeners out there and if you're watching this on youtube make sure you smash the like button smash the subscribe button leave a comment with your own takes on whatever topic i'm talking about in this case with this episode the 2024 edition of WWE Elimination Chamber in Perth. And share this with your friends. Share this with a stranger. Share this with your neighbors. Share this with whoever you want to share this with. And spread the good word of mouth about Veracold Lasagna. And then you can always follow Veracold Lasagna on social media, on X and Instagram at Veracold Lasagna. So that being said, let's talk about this pay-per-view called Elimination Chamber in Perth. This event was actually first announced in mid-September 2023. Um a little advanced in time, like about six or seven months ago. But, um, yes, it, it, it looked first, it looked kind of looked like a big deal because it was taking place in Optus Stadium. So, the first ever, um, WWE Elimination Chamber pay per view to take place inside of a stadium. Um, and the first WWE pay per view to take place in Australia since uh, WWE Super Showdown, um, almost uh, actually five and a half years ago in October of 2018. Yeah, I don't even remember that pay-per-view, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, um, this would be the third straight Elimination Chamber pay-per-view to take place outside of the United States. 2022 was held in Saudi Arabia. And then, we all remember last year in Canada, that um, that good main event. And then, this was the first Elimination Chamber pay-per-view to be held in an outdoor venue. Because uh, Optus Stadium is an open, an, an open air uh, stadium. So... Many were expecting the Canopy Pillars of Doom. If you don't know what the canop- uh, Canopy Pillars of Doom are, um, they basically put like four um, four sticks up, and then there's a roof, um, and then they put like a bunch of LED screens, like little uh, screens for those that are a little bit further away um, from uh, from the ring. So 
people can see, especially if they have those little video boards on the side and you can't really see it. So that what they mean by the pillars of doom. And, it's, and also, especially because if there's no like hanging LED board, because it is an open air stadium, think of like Lincoln Financial Field for those of you that watch the NFL um, and also Levi Stadium. And I think also um, t- uh, Raymond James Stadium in Florida. So, yeah. So, like I said, it's because this was being held in Australia, that mean your your viewing time was going to vary wherever you were in the world. Um, so in their in their country, it was going to be held around five to six uh, p.m. local time. Um, here in the United States, um, it was going to be five a.m. on the East Coast, and then for us unfortunate souls here in California, it was going to be two a.m. at very early as the clock. No way in hell was I waking up for that. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I want to get my sleep. Um, so what I did was you know, catch up, uh, catch up on, on the show in the morning, avoid social media, you know, like with a lot of these international shows, um, that are going way past, uh, bedtime, uh, way past people's sleep schedule. Yeah. Um, I, I want sleep. Okay. I, I'm not a night owl. <laughs> so I actually want to get sleep. So we begin the show with a kickoff show match that was announced like days prior uh, to the event, and that was women's tag team champions uh, Asuka and Kyrie Sane, the Kabuki Warriors, taking on Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae. And this match actually served as a homecoming of sorts uh, for Melbourne native Indy Hartwell. So, Indy Hartwell from Melbourne, Australia. Um, so, a little bit of a home country homecoming for for Miss Indy Hartwell. Um, this match, you know, it's nothing special, um, but I mean. You know, the, the, the baby faces almost got the win. Um, Indy Hartwell got some hot tag offense in front of her home country. Um, the, the crowd was red hot for her. They gave her a, a good, res- a very good response for her. Um, but their downfall began when they took too long setting up their finisher on Asuka. Um, I think Candice LeRae was trying to go for old school. I'm not sure what she was trying to do. But Kyrie disrupted it, and the Kabuki Warriors finished off Candice LeRae with their Scorpion Death Drop Insane Elbow Combo to retain the tag team titles. Nothing special, but I guess Indy Hartwell got a good moment um, to compete in front of her home home country fans. So then we open up the actual show <sighs> with the Elimination Chamber match to determine whoever's going to be the Women's World Champion at WrestleMania 40. This matchup uh, what took place in wake of Women's World Rumble winner Bailey choosing to face her former damage control ally and the Women's Champion on SmackDown, Io Sky. So this interbrand chamber matchup was set up to determine who would face the women's world champion Rhea Ripley, or again, that would have been whoever was going to be the champion in April. So a series of qualifying matches uh, 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 took place uh, throughout the next couple weeks. Uh, leading up to this event, we had Becky Lynch being Shayna Baszler, Bianca Belair being Michin Mia Yim, Liv Morgan being Zoe Stark, Tiffany Stratton being Selena Vega, Naomi being Alba Fire, and then a little bit of a surprising uh, inclusion here was Raquel Rodriguez, who we haven't seen in quite some time, um, winning a last chance battle royale on the Raw before Elimination Chamber. Um, and I thought Raquel was going to be the one in this because everyone thought, including myself, was gonna, it was going to be Jade Cargill. Um, but it's, it was kind of interesting that she wasn't, but also at the same time, I'm actually glad it wasn't. Because it'd be ill-advised for her to take a another loss right now after a debut. Because, you know, Royal Rumble loss is is different. But taking a pinfall loss inside the Elimination Chamber, um, that would kind of hurt her even more. Um, so Raquel coming back, especially after, you know, she had a, like a, um, mass, a mass skin cell inf- infection or a, some kind of crazy infection that's, that really, that's really brutal. Um I recommend checking out her her video that she put out. It's like really bad. It's a skin infection. It's like it's really bad. It's it it really sucks. And there's a uh, she posted something on Instagram and she she was like really uh it it real it, it was really it was really affecting her as well during this chamber match. So I re- I give massive props to Raquel um for pulling through this chamber match. Like big props despite um her, her infection so as for this match um you know her return made a lot a lot of sense and well i guess the best way to describe this match 
is, well, I can do it in only a way that, in in a way that inspired is inspired by a certain YouTuber that goes by the name of the tree. A tree that lives by the days. A urinating tree. So, this is for you, man. This is for you. Bad parody and all. I'm going to do this for you. Tonight on Triple H is a fucking big nose idiot. His wretched booking of the road to WrestleMania 40 takes an overseas flight to Perth, Australia, where the last pay-per-view before Mania takes center stage in front of the Australian crowd, and that pay-per-view was Elimination Chamber Dash Perth. Even though it was airing at very early ass o'clock, it didn't stop many from staying up and watching what was going to happen in what should at least feel like a major stadium show for the Australians. But nonetheless, the two marquee matchups were the thematic Elimination Chamber matches. A match that used to be called Sane Structure, but now feels like the Wiggles House to determine the number one contenders for two certain world champions at WrestleMania. One of those champions was a certain Aussie that was also competing in her home country later that night in Women's World Champion Rhea Ripley, while her potential challengers fought inside the plastic steel structure to open the show. Two of those potential challengers have been a hot topic of debate for the last seven months among all the wrestling community, and that debate was set to come to close in this opening bout. First, there was Becky Lynch, the multi-time women's champion that was the odds-on favorite to win this match. After months of teases and months of stare-downs, potentially was going to set up a major clash with Rhea for the title that Becky believes she's holding hostage. Then there's Liv Morgan, the star waiting for that true chance to have a proper title run, has just returned from injury and is out for revenge against her former tag team partner in Rhea, who had broken up their friendship and team nearly two years ago, but most recently injured her seven months prior, and now little Miss Liv wants to take away everything from her former friend turned bitter enemy. This match starts with Becky and Naomi, and one by one, the rest of the participants come in. Tiffany comes out third as the Australian crowd gets red hot behind her. Liv Morgan then enters the fray, and her revenge tour goes right after Tiffy time. Things take an interesting turn as just before the next participant is set to enter, Naomi gets eliminated by Tiffany using the deadly fruit roll-up. The recently returned Raquel Rodriguez next enters and she dominates the field before Bianca Belair enters to complete the setup. Then we have Chaos. Chaos unfolds as big spots and eliminations happen left and right. Liv gets Raquel again with a big top rope spot from the pod with a top rope senton while Tiffany swantons onto Becky, Bianca, and Raquel moments later. But she is met with her demise as Liv eliminates her with a mid rope oblivion and Raquel follows suit with a KOD from Bianca. And then we have the final three Becky, Bianca, and Liv. After some tense few minutes, Liv reverses a KOD into a code breaker to use a fruit roll up to eliminate Bianca. But she is soon met with her own demise as the revenge tour takes an immediate burial as Becky steals her chamber dreams with a rock bottom for a sad one, two, so the nightmare dream matchup is set. Becky versus Rhea, while Liv Morgan's revenge tour and her fans that want a happy, true ending, a big moment, are left with an unhappy ending instead. And, well, it's just like the days of our nose man. <laughs> Anyway, we had the undisputed WWE Tag Team Champions Finn Balor and Damian Priest of the Judgment Day take on Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate of New Catch Republic. Who the hell is Tyler Bate? I don't know. But anyway, we had two Fatal 4 Way matches happen a week after the Royal Rumble on both Raw and SmackDown with the winning teams uh, face each other to determine the number one contenders um, to the Tag Team Champions. Um, Pete Dunn and Tyler Bate, um, who took on the name New Catch Republic, they won a, the SmackDown Fatal 4-Way match, while Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, a DIY, or DUI as I like to call them, they won the Raw one on the following Monday with Dunn and Bray winning over DUI on the February 9th edition of SmackDown to earn this title match uh, at Elimination Chamber. So, yeah, there wasn't really, after that, there wasn't really much follow-through um, in terms of oh, these teams interacting with each other and all that other than what happened on SmackDown the, the day prior, or like the taped version of it. 
But yeah, this is pretty much a raw SmackDown kind of match. Uh, but anyway, Dominic was there. He had his typical booze in front of 50,000 Australians. Um, he tried to do the intro for um, Balor and Priest, stole the mic from Mike Rome. Um, and towards the end of the match, Pete Dunne was on the verge of winning the titles for his team, but um, Dominic put Finn, Finn Balor's foot on the rope to break up the count. But Tyler, um, Tyler Bate snitched on Dominic uh, to the referee, and Dominic was ejected. Uh, minutes later, the, the Judgment Day did get the win when Damian Priest double choke slammed Bait and Dunn off the top rope, and then Balor hit the coup de grace double stop on Pete Dunn to retain. Uh, I mean, it was a long slog. Like, it was literally a long slog. If you play it at two times speed, uh, like, this is boring. It was a boring, long, long match that belonged on the Raw or SmackDown. So, I'm not sure what people were, why people were chanting, this is awesome, when clearly it was not. Like, this, this was not. And, Already coupled with the problems that I had with the the opening cha- the en- the ending the, the chamber match um, for the, the women's chamber match, this was already trending towards being a crappy show. So anyway, we had the Grayson Waller effect with guests Cody Rhodes and the World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins. This was announced on the edition of the Bump, um, that's WWE's social media show, um, like a week prior to the pay per view, that Grayson Waller was going to host a special edition. Of the Grayson Waller effect in his home country of Australia um, at the pay-per-view. So his guests were going to be the 2024 Royal Rumble winner, Cody Rhodes, and World Heavyweight Champion, Seth Rollins. So I imagine this was going to probably advance the feud that they were having with The Rock and Roman Reigns of going into WrestleMania. So I assume there is going to be something going on involving that. I was kind of hoping that Roman and The Rock were going to show up, um, hopefully. So let's talk about this segment. Um before we move on so actually before we do that like i'm sorry um i don't know if it's like a tradition that happens in australia or this the a cool thing that australians do i mean cool that you do it but it's like i'm sorry um but drinking out your shoe or they call it shoey that's gross it is really gross like like maybe maybe if you're like um like ch- like you're you know you're doing this with your water and then you're going like oh but Drinking out your shoe, really? That, that that's gross. Like like it feels like I don't know. It, even water, like even water. That that's 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 very sus. I mean, like no disrespect. I mean, it's it's not my thing. But if it's your thing, okay, cool. But I mean, it's just freak. It's just a little sus. It's a little sus. I mean, not freaky, but it's just a little sus. But I mean, you do you. You do you, Australia. So anyway, um, there actually wasn't a lot to take away from this segment because, yeah, it, it was just there. It was just filler. But at least Seth did reveal that he was going to be medically cleared in a few days. So, um, yeah, that's a thing. That was a thing. But Cody had a more interesting announcement that he actually wanted to face The Rock one-on-one. He wanted to go one-on-one with The Great One. And then Seth followed that up and proceeded to tell Cody that um, when he does decide to face The Rock, He's going to be there to help him. So maybe in a managerial role or maybe tease the tag team match even further with Cody um, and Seth versus The Rock and Roman at WrestleMania. I don't know. But either way, they were going to like cut off the head of the snake that was the bloodline, according to Seth. And then yeah, afterwards, you had some random bullshit with Austin Theory trying to do his Beck Ross rock impression uh, before he got his ass whooped by Cody and Seth. Uh, Seth stomped the lights out of Austin Theory, and then he pretty much showed his medical clearance. Grayson Waller, um, he didn't help out like Austin Theory in any sense of the imagination, um, because I guess they didn't want to whoop um, Grayson Waller's ass in his home, in front of his home country. So, and whatever, whatever. I mean, there wasn't really much else that happened. So, what all I took away from this was that either we're gonna get Cody versus Rock, or Cody and Seth versus Rock and Roman. Um, hopefully, oh, I don't know. It's like it's like the last saving grace of of a main event on night one of WrestleMania. Like, please, not that match, not that match um, at WrestleMania, not not that certain match or matches at WrestleMania. Please, it's like it's it's already bad enough. It's already bad enough. We have those matches at WrestleMania. So anyway, speaking of matches, we have two more to talk about here. As we have the Elimination Chamber match to determine Seth Rollins' opponent, speaking of uh, Freaky Rollins, uh, determine 
uh, Seth Rollins' opponent for the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 40. Um, so, in wake of Cody Rhodes' uh, shooties that face uh, Roman Reigns at WrestleMania at the press conference, uh, general managers Nick Aldis and Adam Pearce decided to set up an elimination chamber, just like with um, with the women's, to determine who would face Seth Rollins in April in Philadelphia. So, your participants included Drew McIntyre, Randy Orton, Bobby Lashley, LA Knight, yeah, United States champion Logan Paul, and Kevin Owens. They all had to qualify. Um, Drew McIntyre beat AJ Styles, Randy Orton beat Sami Zayn, Bobby Lashley beat Bronson Reed, um, who is an Australian native, um, but a little, bit, a little bit surprising that he didn't get the nod, but um, considering uh, his own circumstances, um, or I don't know what happened, but a little bit understandable. Um, LA Knight, yeah, beat Ivar, Kevin Owens beat Dominic Mysterio, and then Logan Paul beat The Miz. So that's how they all got there. Um, in terms of this match, very solid. Um, Drew McIntyre and LA Knight started off the match. Um, not really much happened before the participant next participants entered. Uh, Knight sent Drew on a headbanging tour, though, on some of the participants' uh, plexiglass doors. Then we had Kevin Owens enter the fray next, followed by Bobby Lashley, Randy Orton, and Logan Paul, who spent the entire time in his pod drawing uh, Kevin Owens, or at least what he thinks of Kevin Owens, um, with a Sharpie. So, <laughs> look at Paul. You can never get enough of him, man. So anyway, um, when Randy Orton came in at number f- uh, number five, he was coming in red hot. But that's when I started to get worried about him because um, when he hit the draping DDT on Kevin Owens on the outside of on the outside padding or what used to be the uh, the solid steel, um, he hurt his back or he he hurt his um, he aggravated his back injury um, that took him out for nearly a year. I don't know if that was kayfabe or that was like legit, but nonetheless, it's like like Randy, we need you, man. Like we we need you. It's like, I was getting, like, when as soon as he started clutching his back, it's like, no. Please don't. It's like, God, no. It's like, I hope he's just selling the, the injury because, like, fuck. It's like, we can't, we can't have, no, we can't have no Randy Orton again. So, we just got him back. We just got him back. So, anyway, uh, Logan Paul entered last, but then we had Kevin Owens weighing right for him uh, from the jump. Uh, and he went on the attack. He went on the, the rar on him. So then we had Logan and Kevin Owens going at it. And then, unfortunately for them, they both went through the plexiglass. Um, Kevin Owens get, ended up getting thrown at uh, through the glass by Bobby Lashley. And then Logan got speared. He got the worst of it um, by Lashley. Lashley speared him through the plexiglass. But unfortunately for Bobby Lashley, he was the first eliminated. Um, he got hit with the Claymore on uh, by Drew, trying to apply the Hurt Lock on LA Knight. And then Knight... Went on a BFT, his blunt force trauma finisher. He won a BFT spree on on both Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre. But as he was on the verge of eliminating Drew, AJ Styles broke into the chamber and laid out Knight with a steel chair assault. And that included uh, a Styles clash on the chair. So I guess AJ Styles is going full heel um, now. And man, talk about being a player hater. That is AJ Styles. You know, you know, flying across all the way across from the United States to to perf you're not even booked for the card and then you still want to show up and break into the elimination chamber and then <laughs> attack aj styles and i don't know this yeah he's he, i guess he's jealous yeah he's jealous now he's officially a player hater lone wolf my ass <laughs> so anyway drew picked up the bones eliminated la knight and yeah he got that gravy so anyway kevin owens was the next out with an rko from randy orton Man, I was, I was still getting concerned with Randy taking another back bump. You know that arc L. It's like, don't hurt your back, man. Like we get, like I know it might be just you selling, but like can't have that. We can't have that. Then moments later, um, the final three came down to Logan Paul, Drew McIntyre, and then Randy Orton. And then Logan dove off the pod onto Drew, and then he got a signature brass knuckles out, um, which he could use legally this time because there are no disqualifications inside the chamber. But then. His cocky, showboating ass got the best of him because, well, he ain't an RKO out of nowhere. He was just standing there like, yeah, I'm going to win this elimination chamber. But then he got memed. He got memed with an RKO, and he was the next man out. So the final two came down to Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre. They called it back to their 2020 Thunderdome rivalry when they're competing in ambulance matches, Hell in a Cell matches, whatnot. Um, Randy Orton uh, was trying to go for an RKO. Drew um, countered it with a spine buster. 
And then he was ready to finish him off with the Claymore. But Randy's bad back gave out. Drew couldn't hit the Claymore. Um, so he picked up Randy Orton. But still didn't learn from those Thunderdome days. Never let the Viper hang around. Because Orton struck him with an RKO. But unfortunately for the Viper, he couldn't get the winning pin because, bam, he got sucker punched by Logan Paul. Logan Paul came back um, inside the chamber to knock his ass out with the brass knuckles. And just like he did with Bobby Lashley, Drew picked up the bones to get his rematch with Seth Rollins at WrestleMania for the World Heavyweight title. So, this was a very solid Elimination Chamber match. I mean, I mean the women's match was actually... I don't know if I preferred this uh, this one over the women's. I don't know. I mean, the women's ending was, yeah, bad. Very bad. Like, very disappointing. But um, the men's match, I mean, we all knew who was going to win um, beforehand. But it came with a little bit of controversy. Uh, a little bit surprised with the controversial part. Um, AJ Styles broke into the chamber, cost Ellie Knight the match. You know, Drew got the <laughs> eight. Drew picked up the bones from there. And then Logan Ball came back after getting eliminated to cost Randy Orton the match. And, yeah, Drew picked up the bones from there. Um, it was a little interesting, like, Drew just, like, you know, just pick up the bones. I mean, yeah, it's playing a heel, but um, a little interesting. But at least they made the right call in contrast to the other Elimination Chamber match. But nonetheless, um, it also set up a couple of WrestleMania matches um, going into the month of March and going into April. But I'm not sure about AJ Styles and LA Knight being a WrestleMania match, though. But I mean, at least it gives LA Knight something to do. It gets him on the card. Um, and I, I don't know. I, th- I would imagine, you know, Logan versus LA Knight would have been the thing. And, you know, that match. That match. Orton versus John Cena. You know, the ultimate OnlyFans collab. Yeah, John Cena has an OnlyFans now. Coming together at WrestleMania. One last time. This time it counts. And now you have an OnlyFans. The ultimate OnlyFans collab. <laughs> but I guess that's not happening either. Like, god damn it. Triple H, what are you doing? What, making bad decisions across the board, man. With this pay-per-view. Like, come on. Now now you're making bad decisions with WrestleMania. First with, with, with the Women's Chamber. And now taking away the ultimate OnlyFans collab. Randy Orton and John Cena. This time it counts. And now it's not going to count because apparently they're going a different direction with Logan versus Randy Orton. I mean, it's not a bad alternative. I mean, it's not bad at all because Randy Orton, one of the most uh, popular wrestlers in mainstream media because, you know, memes. And then Logan Paul, a social media megastar in his own right. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to include Kevin Owens in this because, I mean, he has his own unresolved issues um, with Logan Paul. So maybe it could be a triple threat match for the United States title. But... Should be interesting. Could be a ladder match, a multi-man ladder match. But uh, either way, I I thought this could have been like a completely different, like a completely different like like WrestleMania undercard that involved all these men. But man, here we are now. Here we are now. Um, I don't know if I, (laughs) I honestly don't know if I like it. Maybe Logan versus Randy Orton could be interesting. It could be interesting. See how that's like a, a little bit of a saving grace, a little bit of a saving grace of well, what we're in for on on the upper on the upper card. So overall, I mean, this was a very solid, um, a very solid uh, elimination chamber match. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a plus compared to the women's chamber match with that ending, that ending, with the days of our nose man. So anyway, um, let's talk about our main event. The Women's World Champion, Rhea Ripley versus Nia Jax. The night after the Royal Rumble, um, Rhea Ripley was jumped by Nia Jax. Uh, Nia Jax had been targeting her since um, that Fatal 5-Way match um, that they were both involved in at Crown Jewel back in November. Nia Jax technically um, was not pinned by Rhea Ripley. Um, she actually was dominating her in that um, in those encounters that they had um, in that match. But it finally came to a head the night after the Royal Rumble. Rhea got jumped by Nia, um, and the next week after, general manager Adam Pearce um, tried to prevent a brawl between the two. They made a title match official um, for Elimination Chamber in Rhea's home country of Australia, but, I mean, they still brawled for the next couple of weeks. Um, they had a sit-down interview, which was, oh, God, that was awful. 
Um, and then they had Nia Jax take out the um, Elimination Chamber participants to give her one last look of, hey, I can still be a force. Uh, <laughs> um, to Rhea Ripley's world title. I mean, we all know what the result was going to be. But nonetheless, um, they tried to make Nia Jax look like this unstoppable force um, going to uh, Rhea's home country of Australia. And yeah, this was going to be the main event. So before the main event started, Triple H was in the ring to thank Perf and give the official attendance of over 52,000 uh, people in attendance as the fireworks went off like, woohoo! Um, more pyro um, when we got pyro earlier with Drew winning the Elimination Chamber. So then we had the main event. So, you know, I'll say this first. Um, I'm glad that Rhea got to compete in her home country in front of 50,000 fans and in front of her family and her friends that were sitting ringside. But my God, I'm sorry. That was a very weak homecoming crowd pop for her. I mean, now, unless they toned down the TV audio, they unless they dipped the audio, uh, and, and, and I don't know, like maybe there's some fan footage of what the actual crowd uh, uh, pop was for her. But man, did that sound very weak on television? It, like that was that that is a weak pop for you know for someone that has been heavily promoting. Uh, that had been having to promote herself. As, oh, it's gonna be a homecoming. Like her press conference homecoming or her press conference pop was much louder than the one she got in in the main event of this pay per view. Hell, even Indy Hardwell's pop was louder than this. Great, I think Grace Waller got a little bit of a louder pop than that. Like, what? What, what the hell? This this was your women's world champion. This was your supposed main eventer. And this is the reaction she gets in front of her, for her, in front of her home fans, or her family and friends. Like, oh yikes! And she gets bigger reactions to the state. I'm, not, I'm like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I mean, I'm not trying to downplay it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I do apologize if I am. But it's like, damn, this was weak. This, this is kind of sad. This is it's actually really sad if you ask me. It's like, oh man, and. and the sad thing is, though, it's like they didn't really boo Nia Jax at all either. They were like really indifferent. And I guess you could, I don't know, I guess you can't really use the excuse that, oh, they were tired and all that. But it's like, ugh. so anyway, um, midway through the match, the, the crowd chanted, my hole, my hole, oh, my asshole, um, in reference to Nia Jax's infamous my hole incident in 2021 where she um, slammed their ass. Uh, onto the on the LED ring apron in, in the Thunderdome, um, she missed a butt slam on Rhea, and then Nia Jax hit a second rope Samoan drop on Rhea, but somehow Rhea kicked out it too. And I'm just wondering, uh, yeah, how did she not win that? How did Nia Jax not win the title there? And then that was evidence even more when she hit another Samoan drop on Rhea on the announce table. I mean, the announce table didn't break, um, and Nia also elbow dropped Rhea and. I was, you know, looking at that office chair. It's like, okay, I'm I'm surprised that didn't collapse either. I mean, no, no disrespect, but it's like glad it held up. Um, and then Nia drop Nia elbow dropped Rhea through the announce table, and then she followed that up with the bonsai drop, and then Rhea still kicked out. I was like, what the hell? It's like this woman has been dumbing um a supposed eradicator. A woman that said, oh, I'm the most dominant woman in all of WWE. Yet, her ass is getting beat. Her ass is getting dominated by by the most irresistible force. Like, you can't make this shit up. So, it's it's like Naya tried to finish Rhea for good with another bonsai drop. But then Rhea shoved her off the turnbuckle. And after a struggle, Rhea finally managed to lift her big ass up for a superplex um, that... Gave her a chance, and then one high kick later uh, to the head, she used all her willpower um, on her bad back uh, to lift her up for the riptide for the three count. One, two, three, and retain her women's world title in front of her homeland uh, and celebrate in front of her family, friends, and get that big pyro. Woohoo! Woohoo! We have retained. After such a, after overcoming the big Nia Jax, the big evil Nia Jax. So, so speaking of Nia Jax, I mean, I th- I'll, I'll say, she delivered a really good performance in this match for um, as much crap as I've given these highlights because, man, like, I mean, she she hasn't been 
she hasn't been as unbearable. She's actually has been pretty pretty decent. Um, my chances, my my stance has changed on her since she came back in September. I know I laughed. I was like laughing at it when I was watching that double header on Monday Night Football. I tweeted about it. I was like, ha 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 ha! Oh, Nia, like all oh, WWE could counter Monday Night Football is Nia Jax. Like ha ha ha! But it's like, man, it's like the more time passes, like I, I gotta admit, the more time passes, like the more um, Nia Jax has proved me wrong. It's like shit. It's like I'm like shit. Nia Jax, I mean, yeah, she's not the most crisp uh, I mean, worker. Like, yeah, she's not the most, uh, gra- not the greatest talker in the world. She's actually, uh, yeah, not great. But what she does is that she's, she, she does, she does her role pretty solidly. Um, and she's like this big, dominant uh, female wrestler that, you know, she does her, she, she does what she needs to do. And I got to give her, uh, her credit for that, and especially dominating in this match against Rhea. But I feel like that's that's a problem with this match because this was a big ass chore to get through. Like this was like dragging on longer than it needed to. It was like fifteen to twenty minutes of like Nia Jax just being the ever living shit out of out of Rhea. Like it went on like way too long. I was like this should have been like 10, 12 minutes max. Because we like we get it. We 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 all knew Nia was gonna dominate Rhea. Um it's like a, because that's been the recurring theme for like the last the last week or like a few months or so that these two have encountered each other. It's like we knew this was gonna happen. It's like we knew this was gonna happen. And I and I don't mean it in a you know what way when it comes to Rhea getting dominated by Nia. But for the large chunk of the match, like it's just like, okay, let's just get let's just wrap this up. We all know what's going, especially with what happened earlier in the night with uh, them on? We like we knew where this was going. Rhea was gonna pull that one sudden move of offense and then pull a finisher out of her ass. Like we knew this was where going. Like, did it have to be this long? Like seriously, did it have to be this long? And for a home pop, for a home pop, like I said, this is some weak ass shit from Australia. It's like I'm I'm sorry. It's like I'm I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but. There are some bigger pops in in the international side. London. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, London, like, you know, Neo 2. But the, All In. All In was a bigger pop for for Soraya, for, for Paige. She got a bigger pop than Rhea. It's, it, Soraya's not even a bigger star than than Rhea. But it's like, goddamn. I mean, that might, that might be a hot take or a cold take to say, but it's like, it's like these... The reactions in the states do her justice better, um, as well. For for as much as I dislike Rhea's character, it's like it's it's kind of sad. See, your her, her home country um, doing her an injustice. It it kind of is because they were dead as hell for her when she came out, um, and they were dead as hell for both of them for the majority of this match. They barely did anything. Yet somehow, some way, they're supposed to convince us. That oh this kind of reaction is the same is gonna be better, it's gonna be louder when for a another potential shitty men event with Rhea versus Becky Lynch next month? Like really? And oh my god. Philadelphia is gonna be unbearable. It's gonna be unbearable. It's like my lord. Well, I mean your asses that wanted this match to main event. Well, it better not. Oh God, you better not cry for that too. You better not cry for that too because that's gonna suck. Read the room. Like people, people are sitting on their asses. It's like, like okay, all right. I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to be the S word, but it's like, it's like just it's the truth. It's just be honest. It's like, so, it's like some, some, some of these matches do. I mean, like some of these matches do draw. I mean, like I mean, some of these matches like do do get a, a rise out of people like in a good way but it's like most of these matches are just like uh, they're, they're a big chore to get through they are a big chore to get through and i'm not trying to be mean i'm trying to be, you know, uh like the s word i'm just trying to give my opinion it's just my opinion at the end of the day but this match it went on way too long i mean i'm glad we got to perform in her home country like i'm i'm glad for her 
I'm glad she got her big magic moment, but it's just like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> this is a big drag to get through. A really big drag to get through. So, my God. I guess that was the emphasis of this pay-per-view. The Elimination Chamber pay-per-view sucked dick. It sucked major dick. Not just because a certain individual, uh, in a certain individual, um, I, what was her name? Oh, yeah. Liv Morgan. Liv Morgan lost the Chamber match um, because Nose Man doesn't know how to book her. Um, a elimination chamber match that uh, she should have won, but because you know, outside of both chamber matches, which I thought were were solid, everything else was a big ass chore to get through. Uh like my god, like like I felt like the, even th- with these chamber matches, like the entrances were like a drag, especially the men's chamber match. Like what the hell? What are we doing here? It's like get your ass to the get your ass to the pods. Like it took like almost a half hour, even at half time speed. Come on. So it's like, like a lot of commercials, a lot of like just weighing around. It was like a repeat of like when I was at WrestleMania last year. It's like, like why are we just sitting around? Like get to the next part. Like this show could have ended like an hour ago. It's like, no wonder why people didn't want to stay up at early ass o'clock at two in the morning. Like, like why? Why are we doing this? And, the worst thing about it was like, there's no there, the, the the lack of stars, the lack of stars. I mean, aside from Randy Orton and Logan Paul, I guess, where was Roman Reigns? Where was The Rock? I mean, you couldn't at least had them on the show appear on the Grayson Waller effect, but no, like of course Roman's lazy. Of course Roman doesn't want to appear on the Grayson Waller effect. Doesn't even want to appear in front of sixty fifty thousand people. Okay, that's great because of that stupid contract that they gave him. They gave him. Dumbasses. So, oh man, if this if this elimination chamber sucked dick, and this WrestleMania man, if you thought last year's buildup was bad, oh man, this one this this one in Philadelphia is gonna be a lot. Awesome. It's gonna be something. So, before I get out of here, let's talk about that in in a, in a serious manner. Let's talk about it a little bit of a s- serious manner. I know I had some fun <laughs> with uh, I had some fun with the um, the way I talked about the women's elimination chamber match. Let me give you my serious thoughts on it to close out today's ep- uh, today's episode. This review of elimination chamber. Look, I get it. I was upset. I was upset. Many of people were upset with the way. That match ended. Uh, that elimination chamber match ended, because we ha- we we were right. Like we we have a right to be upset. Like like we know we have we Ripley versus Becky Lynch is a very big match. It's the the biggest match that they could do in the women's division. I mean, I mean, I, I, women's wrestling. It's like iffy it is iffy to me, depending on who the the wrestler is. Um, you know, in certain cases, you know, like. With some, I have a few favorites, but nonetheless, that's besides the point. But the the point I'm trying to make is is that for as big of a match that Rhea Ripley versus Becky Lynch is on a stage like WrestleMania, bigger match doesn't always equal better story. And I know some of you will say, "Oh, they can just uh, they they haven't created their story yet. Um, they they they've been teasing this for months." Yeah. Okay. And then, what? When you find when you come around to a month later at WrestleMania, and they still haven't figured out how to get to the story, it's like, well, wh- where were you? Where were you when we were trying to tell you? Oh, but it's mommy versus the man. And, and, oh, but uh, uh, Becky has Finn Balor. He, 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 Becky, Becky trained with Finn Balor. Okay, where? When? Why? Oh, but 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 Rhea, okay, and so the point I'm trying to make is that yes, this is the bigger match, but the better story, uh, the better story was Liv Morgan versus Rhea Ripley, and the better that that was the better story because Liv Morgan versus Rhea Ripley, the, yes, it, it's kind of a cliche story, um, but Liv Morgan Liv Morgan 
explained it well on the Raw before Elimination Chamber. They were tag team partners. They were they were former tag team partners. Yes, albeit makeshift tag team partners. They were tag team partners. And then they broke up. Uh, Rhea betrayed her um, almost two years ago. And then Rhea decided to join the Judgment Day, which Liv was the catalyst in. And Rhea joined the Judgment Day. They had two matches with each other. Actually, three when Rhea first joined the Judgment Day. Um, I guess if you include that six-man tag team match. And then Liv, like, Liv was seen as the weak leak to Rhea um, that, she, that Rhea was being held back by. But then you go and see Liv having the success, being a Miss Money in the Bank, being a SmackDown Women's Champion, albeit bad booking, ruined her first reign. And then they meet again in the Royal Rumble um, in 2023, being the last two in the Royal Rumble. And then, yeah, Rhea won, ultimately, won, ultimately won that. And then she would actually finally have that success that Liv would have um, at WrestleMania last year. And then, obviously, she's the world champion right now. Meanwhile, I mean, Liv also went, mentioned that she's the last person to beat Rhea Ripley. But, I mean, it's besides that. It's besides that part. She went on to have almost the same success that Rhea had, I mean, aside from the fact that Rhea's had the title longer than Liv. So, and and also the fact that Rhea did storyline injure uh, Liv like seven months ago. Yeah, Liv Liv did suffer a a couple shoulder injuries, which which sucked, but they gave her, they, they gave a reason as to why she was taken out the second time she got injured, which also amplified the fact that this match this feud needs to happen. It needs to happen on... It gives this this feud ample ample vindication. Ample reason to go even further. The distance in on a stage like WrestleMania. Because, you know, some people will argue that they, they can hold this off until like a backlash in France or until SummerSlam, wherever that is. You know, I, to a point, yes. But they could have done that had they not brought Liv back at the Royal Rumble, because that's where my problem lies. By bringing back Liv now, I mean, no disrespect, but by bringing her back now and then going on this so-called revenge tour that WWE keeps marketing for, um, and now I really hate that they marketed it as such. She's going on this revenge tour. It's now become use- as useless as my San Francisco 49ers 2023 revenge tour. Because they ended up losing the Super Bowl. Liv ended up losing the Royal Rumble. Back to back years. And now she's lost another big match. In the Elimination Chamber. So it looks like you know. My Niners and Liv Morgan are pretty similar now. They can't. They can't win when it matters most. They always they always choke. It's like. Kyle Shannon and Triple H are very alike. They don't let. Um, they don't let their, their stars. Uh, finish the story. So, it hurts her credibility, and when, and when, and if Rhea do have their match and feud, um, it's probably going to be after WrestleMania at this point. It's not going to have the same impact. It's not going to have the same oomph as if it were going to happen at Mania. Think of it, you know, if it was Liv facing Rhea and hopefully finally beating Rhea, but again, not going to have the same oomph because you know. If she does beat Rhea, like let's say at SummerSlam, or at a Backlash, think of it as Liv winning the Pro Bowl, uh, winning the Women's World Championship at the Pro Bowl in Orlando. Yeah, think of it like that instead of the Super Bowl, which is WrestleMania. It's gonna be up at a Pro Bowl like event. Like, do you really want that? Do you really want to do that to a wrestler that's, in my, at least in my opinion, I know some people are like, oh, Liv can't wrestle and all that, but it's like. Dude, I mean, yeah, she has, she has botches and all that. It's like that also make me question too. But it's like you see her improving. You see, you see her improving in and out of the ring. It might work. Yes, it can be improved upon. But it's like she's getting there. She is getting there. But it's just like they don't want to pull the trigger on her for whatever goddamn reason. It's like it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. So. If this is the better story, Becky versus Rhea, I don't know what you're what they're gonna do, and 
even without a story, I just don't feel like it's going to be um, a real a really good match. It's, I feel like it's just a match full of hype. Because, yeah, these two have just been having staring contests for the last year. See who's going to blink. And really, Becky hasn't given a good reason as to why this match needs to happen other than, well, she needs stat pad like she's Hulk Hogan. Like, that's not going to work for the mind, sister. So, anyway. I feel like with Liv Morgan, it it just hurts her credibility. And some people are, are already saying, like, oh, what about a triple threat? Like, they can make this a triple threat match. Like, well, you could have also said that if um, if Becky had lost the Elimination Chamber to Liv Morgan. Because now that it's the reverse scenario, there's no valid reason to make this a triple threat anymore. It's like, especially, you know, Liv taking the pin, too. If Liv got eliminated earlier, then maybe. Like, a very small chance that you could have. But now, there's no valid reason as to why um, Liv should be even inserted into that match. Like, Noseman already fucked it up by having her take another clean loss inside the Elimination Chamber. So, it'd make both Noseman look even more bad than he already is. And it's going to ruin Liv's image even more by making her look like, oh, I'm going to shoehorn my ass way, my ass into this match. A, a so-called mega match that people have been expecting. Oh, but no, we're going to add Liv in there. So, it's it's bad. It is a very bad decision. It's a stupid bad, a stupid decision by, by Noseman. And, well, you can also say it's a TKO decision as well. But, I mean... It is what it is at this point. I mean, am I surprised that Nose Man went with the bigger match? No. But am I still very disappointed? Absolutely. Because this just proves that he's Triple H, and it comes to booking, he's no different than Tony Khan. And it, I, I mean, it's, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. He books his favorites. Um, he books a lot of storylines with, with no matches, or he disguises them as storylines. He disguises, like, the unpredictability of, um, to a lot of people, but in reality, when we get to the actual pay per views, when we get to all these big events, it's it's clear and obvious day that it becomes predictable as all hell. And at this rate, you know, I'm not even counting his involvement with the bloodline because at this rate, I think it's more influenced by Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman as well as now Dwayne Johnson. So Triple H, no different than Tony Khan as a booker and. Yeah, thank you, Triple H. Thank you. Thank you for making me even less interested in this WrestleMania than it already was. And it's not even because, it's not only just with the with the way you've handled uh, Liv Morgan. I mean, I'm not trying to be a simp and all that. <laughs> it's just like, of course, I want uh, Liv, like, as a, as a wrestler to be booked better. But it's just like, this whole WrestleMania is like a mess. It's a big mess. I mean, I guess it has a lot of it to do with the Vince stuff. Um, but it's also because it's like there were so many potential matches that could have been like really interesting. But now it's just like a jumbled mess. And also the way we get to some of these matches, it's becoming an even bigger problem. Like, for example, Jimmy Uso, Jimmy versus Jay Uso. It's like this should have been set up like a month or two ago. Like, why, why is it getting set up now? It's like, what are we, like, why are we getting month to two month, why are we getting month long builds to WrestleMania now for like some of these marquee matches? It's like, come on here. I don't know, man. This is a lot of messed up booking that Nose Man has caused. Thanks a lot. Um, aside from the main event, I suppose, uh, which that's, that's even messed up now because, well, um, The Rock, The Rock decided to, um, uh, abuse his power. I mean, I don't know, man. It, it's a very messed up WrestleMania. It's a very messed up re- WrestleMania that supposed to feel like extra large because it's the 40th anniversary. It now just feels like extra small. It feels extra small. And my interest level is even lower than it was last year and even two years ago. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Triple H. <sighs> I don't know, man. Raw's, Raw's in San Jose, and like, well, thank goodness I'm working because I don't think I don't think I would have any interest in going to that. Like, really, the vibe has been killed. 
The vibe has been killed. So anyway, I guess let me know how you feel about this Elimination Chamber event. Did you wake up at early ass o'clock um, to see this uh, to see this pay per view, or well, wherever you were in the world, um, did you watch it nonetheless? But let me know your thoughts on Elimination Chamber dash Perf uh, in the comments on YouTube or in a message to me on social media on Twitter and Instagram at Veracol Lasagna. Um, what do you think about the Chamber winners? They were Becky Lynch, unfortunately. But more fortunately, Drew McIntyre, by the way, I hope he gets his WrestleMania moment in a more positive manner. And shout out to Tiffany Stratton and Raquel Rodriguez, the MVPs of that Women's Elimination Chamber match. And for the men's, uh, Drew and then Randy Orton, man. Like, ah, man, that back bump, that back bump. Uh, it's like brutal, just brutal. But anyway, that is it for this episode of Very Cold Lasagna. I am your filthy casual host, Dylan Lasagna. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 186 of its icy yet spicy sports podcast. And as always, you love lasagna, very cold, in the fridge, with your takes on the world of sports. And until the next one, peace out.